I'm completing the entire mainline Pokemon franchise in chronological order with two challenges standing in front of me. The first, we're doing a hardcore Nuzlocke in all 39 mainline Pokemon games released in North America, and the second, no repeat Pokemon may be used. For instance, if I use Quaxley and Scarlet, I can't use it in Violet, and the same goes for every single Pokemon. Make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel since we're less than 5,000 away from hitting 200,000 subscribers, and comment down below if you've been following this series since the very beginning. Win or lose, this is the end of the line. I just want to thank you all for coming along on this journey. Whether we win or lose in this episode, I'm really happy to see how well this series did for the channel, and I hope that if you came specifically for this, that you stick around for stuff like my Professor Oak challenges, which I'll be finishing hopefully the last, uh, what was it, three or four that I have very soon. I also have my other monotype hardcore Nuzlocks that I do on my spreadsheet, which we have almost filled in, so I'm looking forward to hopefully finishing that in the coming year. And I have some other, perhaps non-Pokemon related videos that you may be interested in. But before we get into the final episode proper, picture this. A winter night, a cozy blanket, and a mobile game that sucks you in like a black hole. Well, let me introduce you to this gem of an RPG. It's not just any game, it's an experience that seamlessly jumps between your mobile device and PC, offering over 800 jaw-dropping champions. From ferocious orcs to majestic elves and everything in between, this game has it all. Ever thought about what makes a mobile game truly epic? Incredible graphics? How about combining it with RPG elements? And when I say RPG, what's the first thing that pops into your mind? You guessed it, Raid Shadow Legends. Now, let's dive into this incredible world together. Right now, the worlds of Raid Shadow Legends and Monster Hunter are colliding in an epic crossover event. From this very moment to March 5th, players can embark on a quest to collect five Monster Hunter-themed legendary champions within Raid Shadow Legends. These champions are inspired by the iconic monsters from Capcom's legendary franchise, including Rathalos, Xenogre, Alatreon, Fatalis, and Ruiner Nergigante. And here's the best part. You can snag the Rathalos Blademaster legendary champion for free just by logging into Raid for seven days before March 5th. But that's not all! Special in-game events will let you earn the other four Monster Hunter-themed champions. Plus, there will be loads of community events and activities to celebrate this epic crossover. But wait! There's even more! Raid Shadow Legends is introducing the Cursed City update, a game-changer with 100 stages to conquer. Venture through its treacherous paths, take down two bosses at once, and claim your spot among the legends. Oh, and did I mention? Completing quests in the Cursed City might just land you a mythical champion. So what are you waiting for? Join the hunt and download Raid now using the link in my description and start your journey to glory. And hey, when you do, don't forget to claim your exclusive bonuses of 500k silver, energy, chicken, and an epic legendary champion Juliana after reaching level 15. Once you're in and crushing your enemies, come find me under the name Chaotic Meat, and if you're fast enough, you can join my clan. Come on, let's make some history together. Click the link in the description or scan the QR code, dive into the action, and I'll see you on the battlefield. Now, considering this game has quite a few important battles in the 18 badges, several Nimona fights, and the endgame barrage against Arvin, Clefell, Penny, the Elite Four, and AI Sada or Turo, and we're gonna need to try turboing through as fast as possible so that this doesn't end up being a movie length ending to the series. Of course, the beginning of the game doesn't help much, considering it takes about an hour and a half to get to anything interesting, but we do get a few inklings of fun here. Firstly, we get a fresh set of starter Pokémon that we can use in Quaxley, Fuecoco, and Sprigatito. For this playthrough, I think Quaxley is going to be my best bet, as a strong water fighting type is super nice to have alongside the other crazy type combos that this game's new Pokémon have to offer. But before we can get encounters, we have to take on Nimona for our first time, and of course, because we already start out with Water Gun, the fight is a gimme with two of those taking out her Fuecoco to net me the win. Now unfortunately, our Poco Path encounter is immediately decided for us, as we're thrown into a battle with a Lechonk as our sink or swim catching tutorial, and thankfully I do capture it, though I think this isn't as bad as it would seem. The ability Lingering Aroma should help in exactly one instance against the champion, and that's because her lead Espathra has the ability Opportunist, which would copy any stat boosts that I get on my Pokémon. And considering you guys know I love spamming setup moves, this ability is going to be able to nullify that and allow me to beat her into the sun, so I'm gonna hopefully keep this around for as long as possible. Also for EVs, I'm going to be doing an attack and speed spread for Quaxley, as well as an HP and attack spread for Lechonk. 
And of course, I go ahead and start doing the speed EVs because I need to get my level at least up enough to fight the second Nimona fight. While cycling the area to get level 2 Palmy and Fletchling to respawn for my speed EVs, I looked up into the first tree upon re-entering Poco Path, where a shiny Tarantula resides. Would you believe me if I said that this is the second time I've gotten a shiny Tarantula out of this tree? Last time in this series, the shiny claws came up. I already had used those Pokemon, which I think was in Sun version with Zubat and like one other thing. But here, I haven't used either Tarantula or Spidops. So this is a great opportunity to get an extra encounter where I didn't intend on getting it. With it captured, I'm ready to do the little Coridon event, taking out Arvin Squovit straight after, and heading off into the South Province Area 1 for my fourth encounter in Fido. This is going to be the most important Pokemon in the run, which you might be wondering why, but I think a moveset of Baton Pass, Agility, Workup, and Protect along with Leftovers Recovery uh, makes it pretty obvious, especially when Leftovers is accessible before the first gym. That's quite an easy EV spread in Defense and Special Defense since there's no reason to do anything else. However, to make sure we get those EVs as early as possible without eating through our supply in important battles, I made sure to travel around every square inch of the available map hunting for items in order to sell so that I could obtain the power items from the Deli Bird Presents store that's in Mesagoza. But to do that, we need to get into Mesagoza anyway, which Nimona is blocking! Uh, but, uh, um, oh, this is embarrassing. Upon further review of my footage, I think OBS decided to get a little mixed up and recorded the Duel Links gameplay I had on one of my other monitors and blocked the fight. You're not missing much, though. I crushed her with Lechonk, but hey, at least you get to see some masterful Tenyi gameplay. Though what's funny is that I picked this game up exclusively to play the new Rush Duel format, where the game is much more simplified. You get to normal summon as many monsters as you want during your turn, you draw until you have five cards in your hand every turn, it's really sped up and simplified to a point where anybody can pick up and play, and it's really fun. And there's not a ton of cards in the format since it just got introduced in, what, September? So it's a pretty easy in if you want to try it out. I very highly recommend it. Enough Konami shilling aside though, upon entry into Mesagoza and getting all three story paths available to us, it's time to get into the meat and potatoes of this adventure. Or just meat if you're like me and you eat low carb. Anyway, first things first, let's go get all of our available encounters I can get before our current level cap. First up, West Province Area 1 houses Capsicid, uh, which is one level higher than our level cap, uh, but I can go ahead and capture it for later anyway, it doesn't matter, with South Province Area 3 housing Charcadet. And last for this batch is Litleo over in the East Province Area 1 to add our first non-Paldea Pokemon to our available pool, though not for a few batches. Another one I'm thinking of using but not dead set on is Gumi from Area 5 of the South Province. I'm really unsure if I'm going to use Gudra here since it evolves so late and I'm probably going to have a pretty well-established team by that point, but I figured since it's here I may as well use my encounter and grab it since it's pretty easy to obtain right now. Well, that seems like plenty enough Pokemon for now, so after a bit more money collecting, item purchasing, and EV training, let's go do some fights. Is what I would say if the game didn't decide to freeze while evolving Tarantula. Seriously, I can spin the camera, I can look at everything, the game is fully controllable. It's just stuck. And I'm on version 3.0. Why is this stuff not patched yet? Why is this not a finished game? <laughs> Pokemon, please. One reset later, Spidops is finally obtained. Now we can go fight Katie and Cortando. One Super Mario Sunshine minigame later, and this fight is pretty trivial. Thanks to the TMs for Calm Mind Protect and Flamethrower being available by this point, Charcadet can solo this fight. But that would be the obvious play. See, since it's a special attacking Pokemon and Katie's lead Nimble has the attack Struggle Bug, it would make no sense for me to do that when I could just use Quaxley's newly learned Workup and Wing Attack as well as Protect with Leftovers to do the same thing much more effectively, alternating Workup and Protect back and forth for 12 turns before laying into Nimble, Tarantula, and the Bug Terra Teddy Ursa with one Wing Attack apiece to win me the fight, evolving Quaxley into Quaxwell in the process. One down, 17 to go, and in case you're wondering, I am trying to make these fights harder by only using the same amount of Pokemon as the opposing gym leader, but I'm not making it a hard and fast rule since I wouldn't be surprised if I forget about it later on. 
Second badge is from a Titan this time, as the Titan Cloth is level 16 and therefore needs a beatdown from our newly evolved Quaxwell. Alternating between Protect and Workup for as long as I can get away with, since Rock Smash does lower our defense, but I am able to get off enough just to use Aqua Jet to KO, bringing us to the second phase alongside Arvin and his Shelter. Thankfully here, he's able to chip away some damage as I do the same alternating strategy, and right before Cloth goes below half HP and triggers its ability, I'm able to swoop in with Aqua Jet once again to KO and win the fight, giving us the dashing Urba Mystica and making it easier to get around the map in a timely fashion. Now the third badge is a little bit more difficult, considering Brasius uses Grass types, one of which being a Terrastalized Sudowoodo that threatens any fire types with rock type attacks. However, thanks to that Capsa Kid that we captured alongside an early Firestone from South Province Area 2, I've got a fully evolved Pokemon capable of surviving any attack Sudowoodo could throw at me while also having a quad weakness to his lead, that being Petalil as I go of course with Scovillain, firing off growth and protect in sequence, all while Petalil can't do a lick of damage with Mega Drain, blasting it with Flamethrower at plus 6 as well as Smoliv, leaving just the sturdy Sudowoodo to survive, using Trailblaze in the attempt to raise its speed beyond mine, but it's just not enough as a second Flamethrower burns the tree down as if it were living in California, winning me the fight and the third of 18 badges. Now for our fourth, we've got a second Titan up here in Bombardier, which is actually pretty difficult for my team to contend with at the moment. This is where Fido comes in handy though, as thanks to the massive defense EV investment, as well as access to charm, I'm able to just sit there and whittle it down, while also delivering a few Thunder Fangs before swapping for Quaxwell, and delivering a few low sweeps to KO the first phase. However, I can't heal between phases here, so Fido's at a little over half HP going into phase 2, delivering a few charms to make sure Bombardier doesn't threaten the rest of the team, but it's soon dispatched by Arvin's Knackley hitting repeated rock type attacks like Smackdown, and Quaxwell after swapping in and hitting a few more low sweeps to put the bird in its place. That place being the top of Bomb on Battlefield since sheesh! It may as well be better at throwing those boulders down compared to the predictable barrage of them in Mario 64. Jokes aside though, that's four badges with our fifth coming up quite quickly as our first Team Star boss is coming up with Giacomo and his Dark types. Thankfully we have the power of Quaxwell by our side with low sweep and resistance to steal so this should be a cakewalk. However, I think it would also be worth evolving Charcadet beforehand. So I head over to South Province Area 2 to hunt down some Bronze Ore, getting 10 fragments to trade in Zapapico to evolve into Armor Rouge, though that psychic typing might not be the most helpful. It's still really strong though, so who knows. Thankfully, none of our Pokemon go down in the auto battle portion at the beginning, and yes, I do count Pokemon fainting during this portion a death, so I have to be wary of their HP bars during these, even if they seem inconsequential most of the time. However, with the fight, I actually opt to start with Oinkalone first here since it's bulky enough to withstand the Starbobile's attacks, first outspeeding Pawniard and KOing it with a super effective dig. Dig and Bullet Seed combined are able to do around 20% to the Sage and Starmobile as it hits with Metal Sound and Snarl respectively, though of course this was after Intimidate so that much damage is to be expected. My best bet though is to swap into Spidops for the super effective Bug Bite, taking two Metal Sounds in the process but bringing the machine down to almost half HP. But since I don't want Spidops to take too much damage, I want it to be the finisher instead, so after using Silk Trap to protect, I swap back into Oinkalone and lay in with a few more Bullet Seeds bringing the upgraded Reverroom into the red as he does the same to John Pork here. From here, it's just one more swap into our shiny Spidops, delivering one last bug bite to... not KO. That is the tiniest speckle of HP I've ever seen a Pokemon survive on. But sure, I guess I'll use a second one to KO and win the fight. But that sure was dumb. But with Giacomo down, that's five badges and 13 to go. Though before I'm able to take on our sixth in Ayano over in Valencia, Nimona challenges me to our third battle. She leads with Rockroth, I go with Oinkalone, instantly annihilating it with a two-hit Bullet Seed as she brings in Palmy, a perfect target for Dig, which hilariously she goes for the same, going second and blanking mine as hers misses thanks to the power of friendship. Not that it would have done much damage, but still funny nonetheless. I go for it again, daring her to just go for the dig back and forth with me, but instead she doesn't go for it, letting me connect to next turn to KO with one shot while of course triggering static. I'm telling you, this ability is a 30% chance not to trigger, even though it says it's a 30% chance to trigger, this ability is out to f***ing get me. And guess what? Michaelone is held down for not one turn, not two turns, but three f***ing turns with paralysis. 
not delivering a single attack to Nimona's last Pokemon in Crocolore, so I'm forced to swap out into Scoville in order to try alternating growth and protect, but thanks to Yawn, I'm forced to swap out again. Thankfully though, I should be able to use this swap out into Armor Rouge to blink any fire attack and gain power thanks to Flash Fire, going straight for Psy Shock next turn to do a little over half as Yawn connects, but it won't put my Pokemon to sleep fast enough as the second one gets the KO on Crocolore to finish the fight. Well, would you look at that? A fight that I didn't set up sweep. In fact, two fights in a row. Didn't expect that to be the norm, but I plan on annoying the hell out of just about every AI in this game from here on out, so sit there for 30 turns doing setup shenanigans and hope you enjoy it. But with Nimona defeated, it's time for Ayano in her little game of hide and seek, those being hide the director in the same spots as every other run, and seek the annihilation of her gym trainers with Oinkalone's dig before getting to take her on herself. She's a bit of a frustrating fellow, considering the electric type isn't something I have the best counter to, not to mention getting paralyzed really screws up my setup strategies, though I'll have to try my best with only four team members to counter her four team members as well. I lead off with Fido, hitting her lead Watrell with three charms, as of course she manages to paralyze me with Spark before I'm done. At least it happened here and not on Armor Rouge as I swap out into it, and Spark paralyzes on the literal first f***ing turn of entry. I am going to send Ayano to hell! Thankfully, I thought ahead for this and gave Armourouche Flame Charge to raise my speed in order to counteract some of the downsides of Paralysis, while still being able to alternate Protect and Calm Mind during this endeavor. The Charms Keeper attacked down enough for Pluck and Spark to only do about 3-4 to four damage per attack, which is healed off thanks to Leftovers, and I'm able to do my full setup, finally letting me KO with a third Flame Charge by the end of it to get my speed to plus 3 as I'm likely going to need it against her Ace Ms. Magius. Second out is Luxio, and despite not being held down by Paralysis nearly at all against Watrell, it triggers twice in a row as Armor Rouge is hit with two super effective uses of Bite, bringing Armor Rouge down to around half HP as a third turn lets me get up a Protect to hopefully get some of that HP back, and therefore more insurance to continue my sweep, but of course the next turn Armor Rouge is held down once again by Paralysis, causing me to have to abandon ship and try something else. Back out to Fido I go as it's charm time again, but instead of swapping out into Scovillain and setting up with growth to complete the sweep, I'm instead remaining in with Fido thanks to our high defensive stats, and our other two move slots being taken up by Workup and Play Rough, giving Fido the potential of sweeping just as well. Heck, it actually works out to the point that Fido breaks out of paralysis with the power of friendship, and I'm nearly able to get back to full HP as Luxio runs out of spark power points, being forced into using not very effective bites to do any damage. But because of that, I have an even better plan. Instead of committing to the Fido sweep, I instead swap into Scovillain as now there's no chance of paralysis, alternating protect and growth for 12 turns before sending the rest of her Pokemon to hell with Flamethrower as promised, KOing Luxio, Belly Bolt, and the Electric Terra Miss Magius to win the fight, even outspeeding Miss Magius in the process. Well, that's a little bit of a shock, no pun intended, seeing as Miss Magius' base speed is 105 and Scovillain's is 75, but I suppose having 252 speed Eevees and a speed boosting nature is enough to push Scovillain over the top here. But with that, that's our sixth badge with no losses incurred, so let's continue on with our second team star base, Mela and her fire types. Now this fight actually takes a little bit of forethought, mostly because if I want a setup sweep, I'm gonna have to make sure she runs out of her lead Torkoal's power points of clear smog, which would continually remove my stat boosts if I don't do so. Thankfully though, now that Fido has evolved into Doxbun and I'm able to add the Litleo to the team thanks to the level cap, this should be a breeze. These two Pokemon basically force Mela into using Clear Smog since, you know, Flame Wheel isn't going to do anything to Litleo because it's not very effective, and it's not even going to do anything to Doxbun thanks to the ability Well-Baked Body, which when hit by a Fire-type attack, will increase its defense by two stages. This comes in later since I led Litleo as the only reason I picked this up is because it has access to the attack Noble Roar, which lowers both attacking stats by one stage on every use. This is probably the best offensive nullifying attack in the game as I don't have easy access to Confide, heck I don't even think Confide's in the game, and I don't want to resort to using Struggle Bug with Spide Ops when it's weak to fire. So it makes for a perfect opportunity to just spam the heck out of Noble Roar until I see Torkoal run out of Clear Smogs, eventually swapping out into Doxbun and setting up three agilities all while taking Flame Wheel, which again triggers Well-Baked Body, giving me plus six defense alongside the plus six speed, then allowing me to set up six workups, and finally Baton Pass over plus six attack, 
defense, special attack, and speed to Quaxwell in order to annihilate both Torkoal and the Starmobile with one Aqua Cutter each to win the fight. Hilarious that Dogspun's ability synergizes absolutely perfectly with my usage plans of the Pokemon. Even if I got hit with a critical hit, my Sweeper is nowhere in danger because I could just protect and leftovers recovery during the in-between turns anyway. Suck on them apples, dip Seventh badge in hand though, it's time for the third Titan, Orthworm. Thankfully this is a pretty easy one with Litleo using Noble Roar to fight back against Orthworm's attacks, finally sending in Quaxwell to resist the Steel type attacks while setting up a workup, then throwing out two low sweeps to KO in the first phase. After healing, we do the same thing again, but Orthworm does have a little bit more staying power against Litleo by nullifying the Leftovers recovery with Sandstorm, as well as trapping it in with Wrap. So it's not very fun. In fact, Litleo gets pretty close to going down here, but thanks to Arvin's Toad School keeping Orthworm confused with Supersonic, I'm able to get away with laying in with a few Fire Fangs, taking it out alongside Toad School's Grass Knot Decayo with barely enough HP to spare, winning the fight, and giving me the Herba Mystica for high jumping. Not the most useful thing, considering backwards long jumping helps facilitate movement much easier, but it at least makes performing that action a little bit more manageable with a bit more jump height. Only one more badge to hit the halfway point though, so it's time to head over to Porto Marinata to participate in auction, win some nonsense for Kofu, and get into battle against the water type big boy. He's actually a little bit of a struggle for me since I can only bring in three party members if I want to keep my rule of aligning gym trainer team sizes with mine, so I opt to go in with Scovillain, Quaxwell, and Doxbun, basically facilitating one setup sweeper with a swap that can resist most attacks thrown at me. It's rough, but it'll have to do. Though unfortunately, I also roll into this fight being in a sandstorm, which seems to happen to me like every time I do this fight in a run. With this though, it nullifies leftovers and I need to go fast to get this setup done, though his lead Veluza doesn't make it easy. Despite having Charm on Doxbun to lower his physical attack and by extension all of Veluza's offensive options, a critical hit brings Doxbun to half HP pretty quickly as I go with for a single agility opting not to waste time with another one since there's no reason to. Wug Trio and Crabominable can't outspeed a plus two Quaxwell, even if they tried. From here, I can just go for as many workups as I can get away with in the face of Slash, getting up three, then four, then five, and with no crits in sight, I get off the sixth one before hitting half HP. KOing Veluza with Aqua Cutter, Wug Trio with Low Sweep, and finally, since Crabominable is a pretty bulky bastard, I opt to go for Protect for a turn just in case that chip damage from Sandstorm ends up mattering doing a little, then going for low sweep, only to miss the KO by another turn's worth of Sandstorm. Now thankfully, Slam doesn't KO Quaxwell, bringing him to just 7 HP though, making me pretty tight about whether or not Sandstorm will KO us both. But thankfully, Quaxwell hangs on with just 2 HP to spare, allowing the Sandstorm to KO Grabominable and net me the victory without any losses and with a matching team size to boot. Phew, pretty risky. No need to do this, but hey, I know I'm cheesing the game like there's no tomorrow with setup sweeps, so I may as well give the game a chance to fight back, but with Kofu done and dusted, that's half of our badges down and half to go. Back to Team Star bases we go, with the poison type being the next target. Thankfully, Oinkalone has Dig, so that covers things pretty effectively, but there are a few other things I have in store for this fight. So I don't want to get toxic poisoned on Doxbund at the start of this fight, so I thought, oh hey, if I get burned, I can prevent both double damage from Venishock and take less overall damage compared to Toxic Poison. Only to remember that Well-Baked Body prevents this from happening, despite me trying for probably a good half hour. Though I did make sure to capture a Cryogonal from Glaciato Mountain as my encounter for the area just while I was roaming around for various TMs like Ice Beam. No big deal though, I should be able to handle this fight pretty easily. He leads off with Skuntank, I go with Litleo, and this is exclusively for protecting against Toxic, though he ends up going for Sucker Punch first, which is a bit of a surprise. But that's fine. I'll just go straight in with the Noble Roars and get as many as I can in before swapping. I get one before Toxic connects, then the second right after he goes for Venishock, doing around a quarter as Leftovers heals as much as Toxic takes away, letting me get a third Noble Roar, but that's the last one I can get in with Toxic on me. I'm forced to swap into Oinkalone in the attempt to use Yawn here, thankfully not getting poisoned and managing to protect the turn after as he keeps using his Sucker Punch power points for some reason, but it puts it to sleep so I'm clear to swap into Doxbun and start setting up with Agility, getting one up then a work up, but of course Skuntank immediately wakes up and hits a Toxic. 
Not a problem though when friendship comes into play though, immediately expelling the toxic as I use a second workup. But of course, poison type with toxic automatically bypasses the accuracy check, so the second hit and it immediately gets recovered by friendship. Okay, well, surely the third time should be the charm for my opponent as I go for a third workup, getting hit with another toxic, which does stick around. Not a problem though, as plus two speed and plus three in both attack stats should be enough for Armourouge to come in, take a Venishock for barely any damage, then dish out a Flamethrower to Skun Tank after taking a quarter from Sucker Punch, then blasting out Revivroom with another Flamethrower, Muck with a Protect and Psy Shock, and finally the Starmobile Revivroom that is not Steel types, just pure poison here with Psy Shock to win the fight. Not bad at all. It went pretty smoothly, but I think those back-to-back -back poison breakouts from Doxbun definitely made it a bit easier than it would have been in games before this mechanic was introduced. Next up though, time for some good ol' Larry. His gym puzzle has already been memorized by me, so it's straight to the fight with him, and I had to consider my lead for Larry beforehand since I'm unable to swap around for my next battle against Nimona straight after, which is a little bit rough when leading Pyroar against her Lycanroc later, but I could probably get away with it. For now, I'm leading Pyroar against his Kamala, if only to attempt to use Noble Roar as much as possible so that once Yawn puts Pyroar to sleep, we can survive any onslaught of slams, stay in, then lay in with a few more when Pyroar wakes up, which is the entire reason this fight takes like 10 minutes for no reason. Thankfully, after two slams, Pyroar wakes up and gets up a Protect before a third can connect, letting me go for a third Noble Roar as Slam is used and misses, so I can get a fourth up before another Slam misses, gotta love 75% accuracy, and then Pyroar is able to get back to full HP with leftovers. From here, I'm fine with getting hit with Yawn on the fifth since I can just get the sixth one off as Pyroar falls asleep, making it so that I can swap into Doxbund and guarantee to see Slam instead of Yawn, doing a whopping seven damage as Agility is set up next turn, dodging as the second is set up before Yawn connects. That's fine, at least Agility is done before the first Yawn puts Doxbund to sleep, and seeing his leftovers is doing a pretty good job at keeping our friendly neighborhood doggo in good health. I'm able to just stay in and wait around to wake up before using workup, getting off two before being put back to sleep. Alright, I'm kind of getting tired of narrating this one. You guys know what happens. No crits, just finish setting up and baton passing over to our newly evolved Quaquavel for the power of low sweep, one-shotting Kamala, the Dunsparce, and the normal Terra Star Raptor in one shot each to win the fight. Now then, how does my lead Pyroar stack up against Nimona? Well, on paper, terribly, but not too terribly at first, actually. Getting it with an Accelerock for less than half is the first Noble Roar connects, which means I have to alternate Protect or else I'll only get two of them up instead of three. Accelerock does around 35 damage on the second attack, which lets me get off the second Noble Roar with 48 HP, using Protect to get up to 55 before attempting a third one, taking 30 damage and dropping to 25 as I opt to take the chance on another cycle of Protect and Noble Roar, going down to just 15 HP as the fourth one brings Lycanroc's stats down even more. And since why not, let's just go for one more Protect just to be safe, finally swapping out into Doxbun at minus four as we dodge an Accelerock, going for Agility next turn after only taking seven damage. I guess that was more than enough seeing as that's how much Kamala was doing to us previously at minus six, so it's just three Agilities, a Protect, and a Critical Accelerock before getting up my first workup. Thankfully, the crit only did slightly over a quarter, so I just have to alternate between workup and protect to ensure Doxbun doesn't get hit with repeated critical hits and get into KO territory. Very simple, easy, effective, setup is complete, but on pass over into Kukwavel, kill everything after taking a quick attack with Aqua Step KOing that, Pomo, which thankfully doesn't trigger static, Gumi with a low sweep, and finally the Fire Terra Skeledurge to Aqua Step, giving me the win. All right, this is going well. We're doing the same thing over and over again. It's working, which means I'm not insane. That should be the thing I get out of this, right? Well, who cares? Since I already have the flight point to Montanevera, all I've got to do is head over there, take out Moist Critical's goons, and actually, hold up. I probably shouldn't use that word for underlings anymore. It sounds way too much like gooning, and Lord knows we already do enough of that around here, baby! With that fiasco out of the way, time for Rhyme with a hint of lime in the eye, which should be considered a crime. Christ, that was terrible. Anyway, Rhyme leads off with Bayonet, as well as Mimikyu as I go with Pyroar and Oinkalone, both normal types that I'll be using to incapacitate both ghost types. Thankfully, despite Noble Roar being a normal type move, it's still usable against them, so I can continue to drop both of their stats while going hog wild with Oinkalone's yawn to keep them asleep. Pun entirely intended. 
Uh, or at least mimic you asleep. I kind of forgot that Bayonet had insomnia. Thankfully though, it does use a physical attack against Oikalone, picking up the Lingering Aroma ability and now allowing for it to be hit by Yawn, continuing to assault their stats with Noble Roar, as well as using Oikalone's access to Mud Slap to both lower their accuracy for added salt in the wound and to break Mimikyu's disguise. Thankfully, it's not as annoying as Gen 7 considering it does an eighth of the damage to Mimikyu once hit with an attack, instead of staying at full, though at this point it doesn't matter. You all get the point of this portion of the fight by now, but with the rest of the fight, it's basically doing the Dox Pun setup, but instead of doing it once, we do it twice. However, I got impatient after about 12 minutes, so I'm only setting up one while using Kukwavl to set up, using Work Up and then Aqua Step to slowly raise my speed in preparation for Houndstone and Toxtricity, which is more than enough after I baton past Dox Pun into Pyroar, using a mix of Aqua Step and Flamethrower to take out Mimikyu, Bayonet, Toxtricity, and Houndstone to take the win. Cool, cool, coolio. Kind of makes sense to say that in a icy place, but, uh... Progress is going well, and the next two badges are both with a cap of level 45. But seeing as one of them's a Titan that I have super effective attacks for, I may as well go for that one first. Great Tusk's first phase is easily handled by Kakwavel thanks to two Aqua Steps, retreating for phase two, which is just as easy thanks to a two-on-one assault. Or that is what I would say if Arvin Scoville and stopped wasting time and just would go for a grass attack already. I hit Aqua Step for a third before getting hit with a stomping tantrum, so I just use Protect next turn, hoping for a Razor Leaf, which we get. And uh, right, uh, Great Tusk's defense are pretty rock solid, despite it being a ground type. Haha, -ha, jokes about Pokemon types. Give me a 10 out of 10 in the comments. Why does this thing not have Energy Ball? Uh, it's not a problem, I can just swap into Spydop, seeing another Razor Leaf get vaulted into Great Tusk's face, while Stomping Tantrum is resisted, taking barely any damage after leftovers while also lowering its speed with Silk Trap as Great Tusk attempts a Brick Break into Spydops, allowing for a third Razor Leaf to take Great Tusk down to around a quarter. Two more turns of Razor Leaf and a single Bug Bite from Spydops later, and that's all she wrote. Now we can glide like Knuckles with the power of Ear Wings instead of Dreadlocks. Yes, seriously, look in the manual for Sonic 3 and Knuckles and you'll see that he gains his flight through the power of dreadlocks. What a goofy-ass franchise Sonic is. But hey, I'm looking forward to Sonic X Shadow Generations regardless. I actually haven't had a wave of nostalgia hit me harder in years until seeing Black Doom in the trailer for that game. Since I grew up on the PS2 version of Shadow the Hedgehog, I'm kind of just getting excited thinking about it despite it being a follow-up to a very mediocre game with a meh story. It's just a nice surprise to see Shadow be playable in a good form again. What else is a nice surprise, though, is that after saving and reloading the game, the Titan Great Tusk reappears in the Asado Desert awaiting capture, meaning I have access to a Paradox Pokemon for the rest of the game. Admittedly, it's not the most useful one, but Great Tusk is technically a different name compared to Donphan, so I may as well grab it in case it does come in handy at some point. Now then, with the level cap still in play, we still need to go straight over to Alfernada in preparation for Tulip's Gym, but we have another rival fight against Nimona first. I should be able to stay under the cap for this fight, but if not, we have a substitute team in terms of being able to swap out, you know, the encounters that we've grabbed, like Cryogonal, Great Tusk, Gumi, etc, etc. Nimona once again leads Lycanroc as I still lead Pyroar despite the type disadvantage, and we're just going straight into the normal strat of Noble Roar, going for two of them as she sets up to just Whoa, I, I just had a freaking stroke trying to say two sand attacks. I don't know why that happened, but my mouth just made the weirdest noise in a freaking video I've ever seen. However, since I haven't taken damage yet, I figured I'd just swap into Oikalone to reset the accuracy, taking two sand attacks before hitting a mud slap. However, she's kind of quickly outpacing my accuracy deprivation with her own, so I opt to go for Yawn before taking a Rock Slide, putting Lycanroc to sleep and allowing Pyroar to come in safely once again, going back to Noble Roar and getting two more of them off before she woke up and misses a Sand Attack, doing the same next turn before the sixth Noble Roar connects on the same turn as the first Sand Attack on Pyroar this go-around. Did you get all that? Well, good, because now I can simply go back into Oikalone and set up a few more Mud Slaps, which... Might be a little controversial, but the reason I'm doing this is because I don't want a baton pass over sand attacks with Dox Bun, so dropping the accuracy of Lycanroc to ensure she can't do it to me uh, makes enough sense to me. And sure enough, this works perfectly, bringing in Dox Bun, setting up, letting me baton pass into Quaquavel, and then KOing Lycanroc with Aqua Step, Palm up with the same without triggering static, 
Sligu with Low Sweep, and finally Skeledurge with Aqua Stepped after Terrastalizing, falling immediately to give me the simple win. Perfect! And now I just have to deposit a few team members, not bring in any new ones to bump the used Pokemon count up, and Wreck House against the... I said Wreck House against the gym. What the f*** is going on? So yeah, turns out this is an issue in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet. The game crashing when trying to interact with this gym in particular. I never had this issue in version 1.0.0, by the way, which was the version I have run all prior runs of this game on on this channel. But I'm using version 3.0.0 here, along with the new DLC being attached in preparation for the Professor Oak's challenge of this game, and it was just not sitting right at all. <laughs> Turns out the method to fix it was by going into handheld mode. Well, friends, this is why we use the wonderful world of emulation instead of actual hardware, because if I did this on console, it would A, take longer without PK Hex allowing me to enter in the likes of EVs after calculating the amount of EXP I would get from obtaining said EVs, and rare candies, of course, and B, I wouldn't be able to record the handheld mode footage without a ridiculously expensive capture card that inhibits the use of the console otherwise. Uh, take a look at stuff like Katsukiri 3DS cards if you're curious. Those things are expensive as hell now that that company has gone out of business. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk, and we'll resume with our regularly scheduled ass-beating of Tulip. <sighs> yada yada, Farrah Giraffe versus Pyroar, Noble Roar six times, Swap into Doxbund, Agility three times, Work Up six times, Baton Pass into Armor Rouge, Kill Farrah Giraffe, Espathra, Gardevoir, and Florgez with Flint. I said Florgez. Yeah, I know the special defense stat is in the 130s, but come on, even stab 90 power at plus six. Seems a little steep to survive in the yellow of all things. Not like it matters, just Florgez being a stubborn bugger to take out. With her taken down though, after that second flamethrower, there's just one more gym, two team star bosses, and one Titan to go before the end game. So let's rapid fire this. One flight into the Glaciato Gym and a terrible skiing minigame later, which I actually completed beforehand because I was trying to get the crash from Tulip's Gym to stop happening, and I thought, ah, oh, maybe if I go somewhere else it'll stop happening. Turns out it didn't and I'd still had to do the stupid handheld mode thingy. But no matter, we're ready to melt Grusha's face off. I lead Pyroar, she leads Frostmoth, and we do the same rigmarole, 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 that's the word I'm trying to say. <laughs> I don't know why I'm keeping all the bloopers in today, but I just feel like it because I think it's funny. Uh, but we do the same rigmarole that we've been doing for most of the game as of now. Noble Roar it to death, swap into Doxbun, Agility, Work Up, Baton Pass over into a Fire Type, in this case Pyroar again since it's mostly just been Noble Roar fodder, but I actually want it to be able to fight something. Flamethrowering down Frostmoth, Bear Tick, Satitan, and the Ice Terra Altaria, KOing all of them in one shot each to end my gym badge hunt. Very nice, though we're still not out of the woods yet. To level 50 we go for Ortega, and after his little nonsense game of attack the Pokemon who are helpless, his fight ends up being a little bit more difficult than normal, seeing as he leads with Azumarill and therefore Pyroar would get slaughtered here. Thankfully, I can just slap Charm on Doxbun over Workup and just Baton Pass over Agility to a Pokemon that can learn Workup. However, this does kind of backfire a little thanks to Azumarill having Charm as well, so it's kind of impossible to outpace minus two with plus one. Uh, I didn't really account for that. <laughs> Alas, I just decided to use Baton Pass over to Kikwavel anyway, attempting to use Workup and Protect to keep my HP high in the face of Play Rough. Uh, but thanks to Kukwavel not having any special attacks, this was not working at all, as the Sumeril immediately went for charm as soon as I got back to minus four with workup. At this point, I figure I just have to outlast the power points of play rough and charm, which was just taking too long. I had already spent about 15 minutes on this fight, and I wanted to get it over with. So I just went back into Doxbun, Baton passed over plus six speed to Scovillain, and just started whittling away at Ortega's team taking out Azumarill with three Seed Bombs following two Protected Bounces, then Wigglytuff with two Flamethrowers following a single Body Slam which did half damage, but was thankfully recovered a bit with Leftovers. Third out is Ortega's own Doxbun, so I have to be weary of Well-Baked Body, using Protect to heal some more on Scovillain before opting to swap into my own Doxbun. At this point, I should be able to just charm down Doxbun and just work up with Kukwavel through whatever power points of Baby Doll Eyes he has remaining. Though again, this takes forever. I attempted to use Oink alone to mud slap it just to accelerate the process with the accuracy deprivation, but it really wasn't helping as much as I would have liked, especially following a critical hit that did about half damage to Oink alone, 
and forced me to take more turns with Protect. All in all though, the Mudslap attempts did work to a point, getting Doxbun to minus 6 accuracy, which I then put it to sleep with Yawn, then brought back out my own Doxbun in order to finally get my plus 6 with speed, though of course Ortega's Doxbun decides to wake up immediately in order to stamp on my day with more baby doll eyes. But I said screw it, I'm committing into it this time. Back out to Kukwavel I go with Baton Pass, then setting up work up over and over and over again until either Doxbun misses enough thanks to the earlier mud slaps, or he runs out of power points. Either outcome is desirable since it allows Kukwavel to get up to plus 6 attack, finally finishing off Doxbun with Aqua Step before the Rookba Starbombile Rev of Room comes in last. It gets a Misty Surge and manages to dodge my first Aqua Step, but the second connects for less than half despite being at plus 6 attack, hitting Magical Torque and bringing Kukwavel into the red. You've got to be kidding me, right? I'm still not done with this fight. All right, well then fine. Back up to Doxbun we go, taking a spin out and confuse Ray before Doxbun hits itself, thankfully snapping out as a second spin out is connecting and hitting a charm to get to minus two. I've got to neutralize this thing so it just can't obliterate the rest of my team. So after a protect, I risk the second charm in the hopes he prioritizes confuse Ray instead. And thankfully he does, letting me get Rev of Room to minus 4 and bring back out Oink alone to once again attempt Mud Slap strats. I'm only able to clear with one before getting confused, but a second one connects during confusion, as does a third, finally letting Oink alone snap out as a fourth connects, leaving me without any power points. I try for Yawn, forgetting that these Starmobiles are immune to status conditions, so at this point it's just down to finding a finisher that won't die immediately. At this point, I figure it's either Pyroar due to the resistance to both Steel and Fairy, thankfully not hitting itself upon entering Confuse Ray, and connecting with two flamethrowers in a row to finally drain this thing's HP, KOing and winning the fight. You want to know how long that took in real time? 30 minutes and 32 seconds on one fight. Next time, just let me sweep you in five minutes. It'll save me the sanity, and you the anticipation of inevitable death caused by a tiny cute red dog's majestic ability to make any Pokemon capable of mass destruction. With him down, the only Team Star member remaining is Aerie and her fighting types, and they are no match for my team. She leads off with Toxicroak, myself with Kukwavel, since I don't think throwing out my fairy type in the face of Poison Jab is a smart move. Incidentally, Quaquavel has also learned Feather Dance by level up, so I'm essentially using it in the charm position, lowering Toxicroak's attack to minus 6, thankfully not getting poisoned during the whole ordeal, swapping to Doxbun on a critical brick break for less than a quarter before using Protect, and beginning to start my setup of agility and workup. I'm able to get up two agilities before getting poisoned, pivoting to finishing my setup of agility instead of going for workup at all, getting off all three before baton passing over to Armor Rouge as Toxic Croak only has Sucker Punch for an offensive super effective move, which thankfully I can take advantage of with Calm Mind. But of course on switch in, Armor Rouge gets hit with Poison Jab and is immediately poisoned, putting me on a timer. However, I can't get hit with Sucker Punch, so I still go for all five Calm Minds as planned before KOing with Psy Shock then using Flamethrower on Lucario, and finally Psyshock to Passimian, Annihilate, and Rev of Room to win the fight, all while Armor Rouge remained above red HP, staying safe enough to complete the sweep and finish the second to last patch of the game. Now then, all I've got to take down is Dondozo and Tatsugiri, as well as the endgame battles. Is what I would say if it weren't for the game crashing on an evolution of Gumi, whom I was planning to use for Dondozo, so I have to do the whole airy fight again. Thankfully, I'm able to get through it without losing a Pokemon once again, saving me the embarrassment. But hey, I at least managed to do it differently enough by using Pyroar in the second attempt instead of Kukwavel. Very interesting, even though I just obliterated it the same way anyway. Now with Dondozo and Tatsugiri, this fight pretty much goes unopposed. With Doxbun being a plenty strong enough wall against Dondozo with Charm and Baton passing boosts over to Scovillain in order to obliterate it in one shot with Seed Bomb, moving on to Phase 2 where I basically do the same thing. Phase 3 against Tatsugiri on its own is a little more difficult though, seeing as it bases its offense on special attacks, and I can't exactly throw Pyroar at a water type. So instead, I just opt to baton pass over a single agility over to Kukwavel, and assault Tatsugiri with low sweep in order to force it into using Icy Wind over and over again so that it can prioritize speed control, which also works in tandem with it deciding that Taunt was a good idea, all while barraging its HP down to zero with a few more low sweeps, winning the fight, the last badge, and the climbing upgrade for Karidon. 
All right, good stuff. Now we can go actually take on some more varied, difficult fights. First up is Arvin, whom I feel comfortable taking out first with my sweeping tendencies, as his whole team ascends in levels, meaning his lead Greedent is level 58, and they go from like 59, 60, 61, 62, and then to his ace Mabostiv at 63. Here I just lead with Doxbun, using Charm to lower Greedent's physical attack due to all four attack slots being taken up by physical moves, though Body Slam can cause a bit of an issue if Doxbun gets paralyzed early, or I, when I get to Baton Pass, it ends up getting the Lucky Paralysis on the Pokémon I bring in to sweep the whole team. Thankfully, Charm is at least able to finish before the Paralysis hits, and I even manage to get up two Agilities before that happens. Though with the Power of Friendship, we break out as the third Agility is set up, with Doxbund once again getting paralyzed. Unfortunately though, because Doxbund is packing Charm, I needed the other move slots for Protect and Baton Pass here, mostly for the HP recovery, so I Baton Pass those over to Kukwavl in order to set up Work Up and go from there. However, of course, Kukwavl gets paralyzed pretty early on during the setup, allowing for Greedent to spam Psychic Fangs, all while I sit here attempting to finish said setup. It even gets so bad to where Psychic Fangs gets a crit, bringing Kukwavl down to just 21 HP, all while managing to only set up three workups in total. Thankfully though, I had a plan B in this instance, now using Baton Pass on Quiquavel to bypass this problem with the low HP and bring over that plus 6 speed, plus 3 attack, and plus 3 special attack over to Oinkalone, absorbing a single body slam that thankfully doesn't paralyze before finally finishing my setup with Workup. But not before Body Slam gets one more bout of paralysis before Greedent runs out of power points. Well, you know what? Screw you. I'll sit here and alternate work up and protect until it goes away via friendship. I'm not dealing with this nonsense. Thankfully, it does go away as I finish setting up work up so I don't have to sit here needlessly, allowing Oink alone to KO Greedent with two two-hit bullet seeds, Garganackle with bullet seed, Toad Squirrel with double edge, Scovillain also with double edge following a protect, Cloyster with bullet seed following a protect, and finally Mabostiff. With Intimidate bringing Oinkalone down to plus 5, a Protect and Double Edge is still more than enough to take him down, netting me the win. Now I wasn't exactly sure if I was going to be able to survive with the Double Edge use because of that many times in a row with the recoil, nor be able to KO Mabostiff with only plus 5 using any other normal stab move, but it did the trick and sealed me the win so I can't ask for much more. Moving onward though, Director Clavel is next on my list of objectives, bringing my team to level 58 in preparation before taking him on, leading Pyroar against Oranguru. Now this thing is quite nasty, with a set of Light Screen, which is probably the least threatening move, Yawn, Dream Eater, and Foul Play, meaning I absolutely cannot set up with Work Up unless I want to be crumpled into a pile of dust. Of course, because Foul Play uses my physical attack rather than Oranguru's. So to evade this and sleep, I just keep swapping between Pyroar and Doxbun, though Oranguru just kept using Yawn on swapping on Pyroar, yet would attack with Doxbun coming in on Switch. Seems like the AI is a little more sophisticated in seeing strategies than I would have initially thought. Thankfully though, I'm able to eventually get Doxbun to set up three agilities and start going for Charm, which I guess is needless for Foul Play since it's using my stats instead of the opponent's. I don't know how that lays out on the stack, like is that applied after or before? I don't know, probably not even applied at all, but who cares? I don't know how this move completely works, don't blame me! Instead, I just want to drain the power points of Yawn and Foul Play so I can finally bring Kukwavl to set up workups, being risk-free and able to KO Oranguru with Aqua Step, Aboma Snow with Wing Attack, Houndoom with Aqua Step, Gyarados following Intimidate with Wing Attack, uh, see, now this is why I did this for Mabostiff. I knew plus 5 would be the difference between KOing and not KOing on something in this game. Thankfully, Earthquake does less than half though, but now I just gotta hope for no crit on the following turn as I go for work up to get back to plus 6. Seeing no crit as Wing Attack gets the KO on the follow up, then finishing off the team by KOing Poltegeist with Aqua Step and Meowskarada with Wing Attack to net me the win. Now then, the last one I want to take down before the Elite 4 is Penny despite the Elite Four level cap being 61, and Penny maintaining a team of 63 evolutions. Not 63 of them, that would be a really freaking hard fight. Actually, would it? I think I would just run out of power points by the time that would be down. I, I don't know. I, I want to know what a fight against an army of Pokemon would be in a Pokemon game. That sounds really fun. However, with her lead Umbreon, this should be a breeze. 
I lead off with Pyroar and go straight for the Noble Roars, taking Baby Doll Eyes for two turns before Dark Pulse does pitiful damage, alternating once again with Protect to keep Pyroar at full HP, barring a crit. For Mirror, we all know the ordeal by this point. Swap out into Doxbun, set up six workups, three agilities, but we have to baton pass to a special attacker as workup is getting negated essentially by Baby Doll Eyes. She's also getting really lucky with special defense drops from Psychic, managing to get two of them, but Doxbun is still able to keep pretty healthy by alternating with Protect. But I get to plus six, Baton Pass over to Armor Rouge, then take out Umbreon with Flamethrower, Vaporeon with Energy Ball, Jolteon and Leafeon with Flamethrower, Flareon with Psy Shock, and finally her Fairy Terra Sylveon with one more Flamethrower to seal the deal, giving me the win and more importantly, the ability to edge up levels for the Elite Four rather than having to keep my team below 63 for the whole five fight barrage and worry about EXP management. So, just a quick hop and skip over to the League and a quiz later, and I'm ready. First up, Rika and her ground types, leading Whizcash as I lead Pyroar, which might seem pretty sus, but A, Muddy Water is inaccurate, B, Noble Roar is a pretty good move, and C, Pyroar is faster. Thankfully, this goes my way on the first turn as Muddy Water misses on turn one, with a second Noble Roar connecting before an Earth Power does less than a third. Uh, that's actually perfect, that's all the damage I could really soak up and still get off 6 Noble Roars while alternating with Protect. However, as soon as the first Muddy Water connects, Noble Roar starts missing. whoop de friggin do it's time for the bullshit to begin! Oh, and Earth Power lowers Pyroar's special defense. Ah, great. Now that I've gotten into minus 4, may as well not risk any more here. Instead, I just swap into Doxbun and immediately walk into a crit Earth Power that does half damage. Great timing! I, I just I just love the great timing on that, because if I didn't do that, Pyroar would be uh, Pi dead, and <laughs> that's pretty bad. Uh, thankfully, she does miss with Muddy Water after alternating Protect again as well, which does let me keep building up HP, but straight after, Earth Power gets yet another critical hit. I mean, surely she can't get a third one, right? So I just stay in and keep doing my thing, barring an accuracy drop from Muddy Water, which... Thankfully, she runs out of power points for Muddy Water without getting a single accuracy drop on Daxbun, so I'm able to use the likes of Blizzard and Future Sight with Wizcash not being able to do much damage with them, and then finish the setup. Finally, Baton passing over to Oink alone, using Bullet Seed to take out Wizcash, Double Edge on Camera Upt, Bullet Seed on Donphan, which is the only reason this thing is even running Bullet Seed because it has Sturdy and I wasn't about to take an attack from that thing then Dugtrio with Bullet Seed, and finally Claude Sire with one more double edge, finishing the fight and giving me the first of five wins. Next up, Poppy and her Steel types, which makes using Doxbun a little worrisome, as well as high horsepower on Pyroar, but we're just gonna do it anyway. Noble Roar is able to get off twice as she wastes her first turn with Stealth Rock, making high horsepower only do a little more than a third. And I'll talk about Deja Vu. Thankfully though, I do manage to get Kaparaja to minus 6 rather than just minus 4 before swapping into Doxbun. Finally being able to dodge a heavy slam on switch in, and then use Protect proactively to start draining those power points. The third also misses as I start doing my setup as usual, essentially guaranteeing me complete setup as there's only 10 power points, so at max I'm only going to take 3 of them if I keep alternating Protect. Play Rough doesn't do barely anything once Heavy Slam is out of power points, letting me finish the setup with zero threat, but on passing over to Scovillain to take out Copperaja with Planethrower, as well as Corviknight and Bronzong, leading to Magnazone. Unfortunately, I don't really have an option for multi-hit fire moves here that would make Sturdy a non-factor, but at least Magnazone is kind enough to make Sturdy a non-factor by wasting its one and only turn with Light Screen. Like that's gonna matter with how much power is going behind these Flamethrowers. Death to Magnazone, death to Tinkaton, that's two down, three to go. Now with Larry, I don't really need to spend too much time on him, as his lead Tropius is pretty easy to contend with. It's just the basic Pyroar, Noble Roar nerfing, swapping to Doxbun to set up work up and agility, then finally Baton passing over to Armor Rouge this time to KO Tropius with Flamethrower, Staraptor with Flamethrower, Oricorio with Flamethrower, Altaria with Psy Shock, we gotta spice things up sometimes, and finally Flamigo with Flamethrower to eat the man alive. All that remains is Hassle, and he's a little bit of a struggle because his lead Noivern has Super Fang, and can't really do anything about that one, it just does half damage every time it connects. However, I still do the same thing with Pyroar, using Noble Roar and Protect to alternate and nerf all of Noivern's other attacks, which thankfully is more than enough for me to get to minus 6. Well, that and a few Super Fang misses, but from there we're able to swap into Doxbund, do our setup as per usual, and finally Baton Pass into... 
no one. That's right, it's finally time for Doc Spun to be the star instead of the jobber of sorts to the stars of the theme. Draining Kiss managing to KO Noivern and fully heal Doc Spun as Dragalge enters second. Sure, it's a poison type, but Draining Kiss is still neutral here. Doing over half as Sludge Bomb doesn't KO, letting me alternate with Protect and a second Draining Kiss to KO, though Poison Point does poison Doc Spun, which is unfortunate, but the healing from Draining Kiss is more than enough here taking out both Haxorus and Flapple to leave just Pax Caliber. It manages to Terastalize, but uh, Draining Kiss is still not enough to cut it here with only 40 power, leaving it into the red as it misses with Icicle Crash. Well, uh, that was easy. One more connects to KO and give me the last win of the Elite Four, leaving just the champion Gita. Now then, with her lead as Spathra, this thing has the ability Opportunist. This allows it to copy any stat boosts I give myself. Sounds like it kind of completely bones my strategy though, right? Well, guess what? This is why we caught the stupid LeChunk at the very beginning of the game. Because who cares when I have an Oikolone with Lingering Aroma, negating his Spather's ability and letting me do the thing? I just love doing the thing. The only other thing I had to contend with though was Lumina Crash, lowering the special defense of the Pokemon it's used against on by two stages but only having 10 power points and is easily resisted thanks to swapping in between most of my team members and Armor Rouge. But to boil this fight down to the basics, once its ability is swapped to Lingering Aroma and out of Lumina Crashes, I'm able to finish the Noble Roar nerfing, setting up Agility and work up with Doxpun, and finally Baton Pass over to Armor Rouge to KO his Bathrobe with Shadow Ball, Avalug with Flamethrower, King Gambit with Flamethrower, Veluza with Energy Ball, Gogo with Flamethrower, and finally the Rock Terra Glamora with Energy Ball to win the match. And with it, the Paldia League Championship. Ah, oh, you guys are cheapskates. Where's my championship belt for winning? Well, at least they didn't give me a freaking ring instead. I'd be even more insulted. Speaking of which, let me just go on a diatribe real quick and say no, Konami. That is not an appropriate prize for Yu-Gi-Oh's undisputed UDS Championship. A ring does not substitute for one of the best belt designs made for a non-wrestling product. I mean, come on. If you guys are familiar with the original DM anime in Season 4 with the Seal of Orikalkos, the Orikalkos Championship is literally the most well-designed belt outside of wrestling and deserves more love. I mean, even the other belts that are designed around monsters like Exodia and Elemental Hero Neos look fantastic, and I just don't understand why they made it a ring. Why not just put all the belts on the line and then whoever wins gets to walk away with more belts than Ultimo Dragon when he had the Super J crown? Anyway, my last complaint is that they don't sell replicas of these belts. I really want to buy them. Anyway, there are only two more major battles to handle before moving on to Violet in Nimona and AI Sada, so let's just sweep them and move on our way to the final game of this series. I can't believe this has been running since September of 2022, by the way. I am very sorry for how long it took. Next time, I'm just gonna do all of this on stream and see if I can finish all 39 games in a month. I mean, look at the likes of Nathaniel Bandy doing like the 2D Sonic and Mario games, as well as Yakko CMN's I Beat Every 3D Sonic Game in a Week video, and you'll understand what I'm getting at. I think it would be pretty fun. Anyway, Nimona leads with Lycanroc, and if you remember how these fights went before, it goes the same way here. Nerf Lycanroc into the ground with Noble Roar and Charm, Baton Pass stat boost from Daxbund into my party member of choice, in this case being Quick Wobble, then Wreck Shop after finishing my workup setup by KOing Lycanroc with Wave Crash, Palmet with Wave Crash, the Dunsparts with Close Combat after getting a critical drill run, putting me out of range to survive recoil damage from Wave Crash, Doing the same to Orthworm and Gudra, and leaving just Skeledurge once I have enough HP to finish it with Wave Crash to win the fight, leaving just Sada. One Area Zero later, in which I do capture a Flutter main, which honestly I should put into the team immediately due to being the best special attacker in the entire franchise at this point, uh, but out of laziness I do not, and with that it's finally time. AI Sada is here, and I'm ready for a barrage of nightmare, as this fight is where things could take a turn for the worse if I don't handle her lead Slitherwing effectively. Oh, wait. It's almost impossible to do that when your first Noble Roar connects with Pyroar, and immediately it dies to a critical low sweep. So much for a Deathless Scarlet version. I don't understand why it's always against the last battle of the game, in like every single run I do, where something immediately dies. It is just a curse, and it's probably second most to me not being able to hit a f***ing range. 
Anyway, backup plan time is Charm on Doxbund will have to carry. Doing so and surviving any attack Slitherwing can throw at her, all while setting up agility in the face of Low Sweep. Which does mean I have to keep my speed up while also continuing to set up workups. All so that my Baton Pass party member of choice doesn't get outsped later by the likes of Fluttermane and Roaring Moon. But that's not a problem as I do manage to get 2 plus 6 attack, special attack, and speed before Baton passing into Kukwavel. Dropping to plus 5 speed off of a low sweep, but finishing the run as we started. With Wave Crash on Slitherwing, Screamtail and Fluttermane, and then with Close Combat on Sandy Shocks, Brute Bonnet, and Roaring Moon to completely wipe the field of any paradoxes that exist, winning the match and the run in pretty efficient fashion. Though I guess I should mention the last last fight where I'm forced to break my own rules in a billion different ways using a legendary and Coridon and being forced to terastalize to defeat the Guardian of Paradise Coridon. but screw you, I already finished the last fight with my main team, this is just padding and therefore I don't care. On to Pokemon Violet. So with Violet, since we're in the last game, I no longer am worried about preserving Pokemon, as it's the end of the series and I want to go out with a bang, and with some more type advantage in terms of team compositions for every fight. For my starter choice though, I go with Fuecoco since Sprigatito is just not that good. I mean, I like Meowscarada, don't get me wrong, I just think that I have plans to capture a Smoliv and a Toad School as grass type options, so therefore I'd rather take the fire type so that I actually have one, since there's not really many others at this point, Eevee training it in special attack and speed. Then go on a catching spree for my first few encounters. First up, Palmy is from the Poco Path, adding an eventual electric fighting type, which is exactly what Electivire should have been. Attack and speed EVs for this friend, all of the attack and speed, thank you very much. Arvin also goes swimmingly with two team members, taking out his Squovit with a mix of Palmy's Thundershock and Fuecoco's Ember, leaving him in the dust and leaving me to access Area 1 of the South Province, capturing Choodle as my encounter. We didn't use it in Gen 8, so why not grab a physical water and rock type? I mean, may as well. I also decided instead of speed that I'd mix in a balance of HP and defense while maxing out in attack EVs. After all, I'm not outspeeding anything with a Dreadnought, no siree. No more encounters for me though until I get into Mesagoza and sent off on my treasure hunt though. So after training up to level 12, I'm able to head into the fight with Nimona, taking out her Sprigatito with two of Fuecoco's Embers, and then Palmy with a few mud slaps. Sure, accuracy deprivation is a little unfair when she isn't doing the same, but it's super effective. My brain automatically wanted to go for that instead of 60 power stab ember, which would have theoretically done more damage than the 40 power super effective mud slap. I guess I still haven't evolved past the monkey brain click on the super effective move because ooh incentives from unique dialogue or something like that, I don't know. I just click buttons man, I just click buttons and it works. Now then, all the beginning stuff out of the way, off to start our badge collecting journey for the final time. Firstly though, Area 2 of the South Province houses that good old Smoliv I mentioned earlier, while Area 3 contains cloth. Last but not least for the time being, the Pokemon League area actually has some low level Pokemon, particularly with the normal type Tandemouse. I love this Pokemon, the evolution's great in VGC, and can use the gimmicky loaded dice held item to just go absolutely bonkers with Population Bomb for being able to hit up to 10 times, but that'll be much later as it's a pretty late level up move for Mousehold. Now of course I want to collect 6 leftovers as well as high quality TMs in preparation for the upcoming badges, so I decided to go out of my way to build up my cash from random items thrown all over the place. Though the TMs aren't really too much of a necessary part of the arsenal yet, as the first gym battle against KD goes well enough with Fight Coco and just spamming Ember. One-shotting Nimble, Tarantula, and the Bug Terra Teddy Ursa with a critical hit to win the first of 18 badges. Second of 18 goes well as the Titan Cloth is easily dispatched by Choodle in the first phase, taking it out with four water guns, but the second phase requires a little more. Using Smoliv's combo of Growth and Protect with Leftovers along with Absorb to take it down, though I miss the range to KO Cloth after Arvin's Shelter goes down, forcing me to swap into my own Cloth, taking a Rock Smash for a little less than half, then mine out speeds and KOs with its own Rock Smash next turn to give me my second badge. See, I'm telling you, the ranges are always the bane of my existence, even though they're just slightly inconvenient about 90% of the time. Anyway, third badge up, of course, is Brasius over in Artazone, with my newly evolved Crocolore being a pretty obvious choice for this fight. 
However, due to Smoliv not being able to go to sleep with Petalil's Sleep Powder and not having a non-grass type move on said Petalil, it's pretty easy for me to just set up six growths and run wild with Swift. Taking out Petalil, the mirror match of Smoliv, and finally Sudowoodo after taking it down to Sturdy with a single Swift, finishing it off with a second to win the fight in short order. Batch 4 from the Titan Bombardier isn't too terribly difficult either thanks to a few new encounters. With Gibble being available from Area 1 of the West Province, being trained in attack and speed, and by the way, my goodness, how have I not used Gibble yet? That is just an amazing free dragon type that can rip through most areas of the game. Not to mention, I'm able to evolve Palmy now into Palmo, and then straight into Palmet one level later after running around with it for over a thousand steps giving me a great fully evolved electric option for Bombardier. It also gets access to Charm, so I can incapacitate Bombardier from using the flying type attacks for neutral damage, then use the likes of Nuzzle to paralyze it before swapping into Gibble, who I've decked out with some TMs from across the region like Dragon Claw and Rock Slide, making quick work of the first phase. Second phase has me use Palmet a little bit more, paralyzing it pretty quickly with Nuzzle and using Charm to incapacitate its attack stat once more, Though Torment does slow down my progress and it has to make me alternate with Arm Thrust to both add on damage and keep that attack stat from mattering against either myself or Arvin's Knackley, eventually taking it down without having to use another Pokemon and taking my fourth badge. No new additions to the team in preparations for our fifth badge though against Giacomo, as I've already got a plenty of fighting type options for his dark types, leading with Palmet against his Pawniard and immediately using Charm, alternating with Protect, then using Workup to boost the power of my newly obtained Brick Break to both one-shot Pawniard and Rev of Room to make short work of him. But before I can go after my sixth badge against Iano, I of course have my third battle against Nimona, whom I make short work of, as per usual leading Rockruff as I go with Palmet and just doing the same thing, using Charm to keep the attack stat down while working against her uses of Howl, boosting Palmet with the likes of Bulk Up now instead of Work Up, but I had to sacrifice Protect so that I could have two move options here, with both Brick Break and Dig so that I could take out Rockruff with Brick Break, Palmy with Dig, though of course she's always going second so I can't hit Dig when she goes for it, so I just swapped using Brick Break on turn 3 against it, then use it once more to take out her Grass Terra Florigato, winning and leaving me to compete with a literal electric VTuber. Seriously, the VTubers keep taking over my YouTube recommended algorithm and I can't get them to go away! Sometimes you just need a break, man. Palmet is once again the perfect Pokemon for this fight though, as I don't take major damage from electric moves, can't get paralyzed, and have free reign to lower her lead Watrol's attack stat with Charm before swapping out for my newly evolved Gabite, with the ground typing to also be immune to paralysis, setting up Sword Stance and alternating Protect before taking out Watrol with Dragon Claw, Luxia with Bulldoze, Belly Bolt also with Bulldoze, and finally the electric Terra Miss Magius with Dragon Claw due to Levitate, winning the match quickly. Gabite's already proving to be a pretty good asset at this point. Can't wait to get access to Earthquake and make this thing a true monster. A shame it doesn't get Dragon Dance though, but I will eventually get access to Baton Pass with a certain encounter I plan on adding my team soon. Now before taking on Mela, I figured I'd run around and take down a few trainers to get some of the TM and item rewards in the early areas, like Thunder Wave, Aerial Ace, and the Clear Amulet, which is a pretty convenient item to have against the likes of Intimidate and Lumina Crash in the future. Anyway, Mel is a pretty simple fight thanks to the power of Dreadnought, having access to Razor Shell and Rock Tomb to super effectively take down her Pokemon, but only after outlasting Torkoal's Drought. Of course, this just leads me to do the setup sweep with Palmet instead, using Charm to take out Torkoal's attack stat so that Flame Wheel is incapacitated, then swapping to Gabite and alternating between Sword Stance and Protect to deplete all power points of Clear Smog until I can get to plus 6 and take out Torkoal with Bulldoze, but not quite Rev of Room after being burned with Blazing Torque on the first turn, which makes it do less than half. But thanks to the speed drop negating Rev of Room's speed boost, I'm able to stay in and use two more, surviving through the barrage and taking out Rev of Room to nail down my seventh badge. Eleven more to go with the Titan Orthworm being pretty simple to take down thanks to Pomet, just blasting the first phase with two Brick Breaks, then using it in the second phase along with Charm so that Toad School could do some damage first, taking it down in a combo of two Grass Knots and two Brick Breaks following that. It's crazy how much easier Titans are, by the way, in comparison to Totem Pokemon in Gen 7. They just feel a little too easy. Next up on the docket, though, is Kofu, which thankfully is, again, simple due to my newly evolved Mousehold having access to Charm. 
This gives me a backup plan for Kofu's lead, Veluza, due to it having Aqua Cutter, a high crit ratio water type move that can potentially bypass my stat drops more than usual. So I figure having two Pokemon with Charm, especially the one that I want to set up in Palmet as the backup, would be the best decision for taking him down. Aqua Cutter does end up getting a critical hit on Mouse Hold, though it wasn't enough to keep it from getting Veluza to minus 6 attack. Swapping for Dreadnought first and using two Rock Tombs to both lower its speed as it's a really fast Pokemon, and to eat up a few more power points of Aqua Cutter to further inhibit Kofu's chances of screwing up my sweeping potential. From here, I just swap over to Pommet, set up my six bulk ups, then alternating Wild Charge and Protect to KO Veluza, Wug Trio, and the Water Terra Crabominable all in one shot to win. I'm not gonna lie, I wanted to resort to Wild Charge here instead of a lower power physical electric move without recoil, just because of Crabominable. I have had a nasty history in my challenges in this game, with that thing surviving on very low HP, despite being at plus six physical or special attack and it still being able to fire back with something like a Water Terra boosted Crab Hammer. And I was not about to have Pommet go down like that, especially when it's been such a helpful Pokemon in the run so far. With him done for though, it's time for Atticus and his poison types. And while yes, Gabite theoretically will be a great Pokemon for this, I'm not sure if I want to throw it in front of Toxic. But I think it'll be safe enough to do if I decide to just have it hold a Petchaberry instead of Leftovers, and use a single Sword Stance instead of going Hog Wild with my full setup. However, his lead Skun Tank doesn't go for Toxic on turn 1, instead wasting time on Sucker Punch, and allowing Gabite to get to plus 4 instead with a second Sword Stance before hitting Toxic allowing me to KO next turn with a Bulldoze following a Sucker Punch. While it does just a hair under half damage, I can just alternate between Protect and Bulldoze to recover HP, all while taking out Revivroom and Muck, getting to the Starmobile Revivroom and missing the one-shot with Bulldoze, but thankfully surviving a spin-out with 15 HP thanks to all of that Leftovers recovery. KOing next turn with the second Bulldoze to win the match, and with it, enter the double digits of badges with 10. Eight more to go and we'll be set for the end game, but I think I want to expand the team rather soon in order to have more type advantages going into these later, more difficult fights. However, with Larry, I think it'll be easy enough to just take him and Nomona down straight after with the power of Mousehold and Palma, being able to swap in between using Charm and dodging Yawn, starting to take a few slams but letting Palma set up all six bulk ups needed to hit Dig to KO Kamala, the Dunsparce, and the normal Terra Staraptor all in one hit to win. Kinda wanted to go with Dig here instead of Brick Break just for the extra turn underground for Leftovers recovery in case Slam and Yawn ended up getting in the way far too much and lowering Pommet's HP during the beginning stages of the fight, but it didn't end up coming up. Anyway, straight after, as usual, is Nimona leading Lycanroc as I go with Charm on Mousehold, getting it to minus 6 while alternating Protect before swapping out for Cloth setting up Sword Stance while alternating Protect, then whittling away at her team, taking out Lycanroc with X-Scissor, Gumi with X-Scissor, Palmo with Rock Tomb, and finally Meowskarado with X-Scissor to win the fight following a very close call with her outspeeding using Flower Trick to bring Cloth down to 5 HP. But of course, with the ability Shell Armor, I knew I was always surviving that attack despite it appearing risky. Not bad at all, but with only 7 more badges to go, I figure it's time to go for some new encounters. Those being Impidimp in the Tag Tree Thicket, Varum from Area 3 of the East Province, Shrudel from Area 2, Gimigul from Area 1, Girafferig from Area 2 of the West Province, Toad School from Area 3, Saviper from Area 5 of the South Province, and finally Dreepy from Area 4, which let me tell you, took so long to finally pop up despite using Dragon Encounter Boost sandwiches that I forgot to hit record when it finally popped up. It took probably over an hour, but Hey, at least we have it. Too bad it doesn't evolve into Dragapult until fucking level 60, so I can't really use it until endgame. And hey, at least I get to use one of the coolest dragon types in the game that just blasts through anything that moves at this point. Oh yeah, and what else took an ass load of time? Was getting 999 Gimme Gule coins from across the region to evolve mine into Goldango. But having a Steel and Ghost type combo in preparation for Rhyme just seemed too tantalizing to pass up. Especially when, again, it's one of the best Pokemon in the game. The amount of Ghost and Dark types I actually have for this fight is pretty staggering as well, seeing as I have Skeleturge, Goldango, and Grimmsnarl, as well as backup from Dreadnought with Crunch, Gabite with Bite, and Revivroom with Steel-type moves for Mimikyu exactly. So Rhyme leads with Bayonet and Mimikyu as I go with Revivroom and Goldango, taking a double attack of Shadow Sneak and Sucker Punch to bring Goldango into the yellow, but firing back with Poison Jab on Mimikyu to destroy its disguise, all while one-shotting Bayonet with Shadow Ball, taking it down and granting my team a plus one boost in attack and special attack thanks to the crowd. 
Of course, I want to take advantage of this as long as possible, so I stay in with both and protect with Goldango, expecting it to be double targeted again by Mimikyu in the incoming Houndstone, which it is, but instead of both happening, it's Shadow Sneak and Phantom Force, making me have to KO Mimikyu with Poison Jab this turn, gaining another plus one boost, but then requiring me to use Iron Head on the Ghost Terra Toxtricity next turn, and then have to swap out Goldango for Grimmsnarl to resist Phantom Force, as I can't protect against it, it just breaks through. However, that doesn't really matter, as from here it's just an easy plus two Iron Head to take out Houndstone next turn, winning the fight, and making that probably the most digestible double battle I've ever narrated over. Usually they're all over the place, but that felt really succinct, but still requiring strategy that wasn't setting up for the 10,488th time. As for the next badge against the Titan Iron Treads, I also don't have to set up for the 10,488th time, as I can just blast it with a single Skeledurge Flamethrower following an Iron Head for Phase 1. Then for Phase 2, I shift over to using Toad Scroll, putting Iron Treads to sleep with Spore before letting it get blasted with a scary face from Skullvillain, and firing off Mudshot with Toad Scroll to further lower that speed. It's simple enough, though Skullvillain ends up going down as I put Iron Treads to sleep with a second Spore, but hey, I managed to take it down with Mudshot all while it stayed asleep, so who cares? I win. That's the gliding upgrade for Maridon, which should help immensely for grabbing those remaining TMs that I need to fully deck out my entire encounter list. But for now, I just headed on over to Alfernada for my next battle against Demona, and to hopefully dodge any and all crashes relating to Tulip's Gym, because Jesus Christ, that was a nightmare in Scarlet. After shifting around my team, I'm going into Nimona's lead Lycan Rock with my Palmet, using Charm to lower her attack, all while having to play around Sand Attack, which is frustrating, but it's easy enough to do with switching and ensuring that it runs out of power points. However, my Fair Giraffe takes a critical Rock Slide during this time, so I decide to pivot over to Toad Scroll to put her to sleep with Spore, and attempt to set up with Fair Giraffe's Agility and Nasty Plot during that time, while recovering HP with Leftovers. But of course, she's not out of sand attacks yet, so upon waking up, we're back to accuracy shenanigans, forcing me to go back into Toad Scroll only to eat a critical hit crunch this time. Well, at least it's fine, I can put it back to sleep and use Mega Drain for half damage to get back to a healthy range before swapping back into Farah Giraffe. Finally setting up two agilities before seeing too many defense drops from Crunch, so thankfully my baton pass target in Arbolova has growth, so that's not much of a problem at all. This, in addition to Crunch triggering the Seed Sower ability, which sets up Grassy Terrain, gives me even more recovery during my setup, ensuring Arbolova stays at full HP while using 6 Growths and taking out Lycanroc with Energy Ball, Sligu with Swift, Palmet with Swift, and finally Meowskarata with the third Swift to end the fight, well, swiftly. I know, I'm just the master at bad puns. Well, somebody's gotta take that mantle after Chugga Conroy got cancelled. Kind of a big shame, really. He was the creator who kind of introduced me to this whole YouTube thing in 2008 and got me started on a decade-long learning experience that eventually led me to making this channel and making Pokemon challenges for the platform. Sentiment aside, though, and ruined childhoods, Tulip's Gym goes without a hitch in handheld mode, letting me take on the woman herself. She leads with her own Farrah Giraffe, being focused on physical attacks like Crunch and Zen Headbutt, while only having Reflect as a third attack with no fourth in sight. So this is a pretty efficient nerf and setup sweep, using Charm on Arbolova to lower the physical attack and setup grassy terrain thanks to the physical attacks from Farrah Giraffe, swapping to my own to then set up three agilities, finally Baton passing back into Arbolova for six growths in order to take out Farrah Giraffe, Gardevoir, Espathra, and finally Florges, all with one energy ball apiece. Not surprised that Floor just actually went down in one shot this go-around, considering our Bolova has one of the craziest special attack stats of all time. That just leaves one more gym badge, two star badges, and one titan badge to go, with Grusha coming up next and getting blown away pretty quickly with the likes of Grimmsnarl setting up Confide against her lead Frostmoth, lowering his special attack. Yeah, if I don't have Noble Roar, I'm at least gonna have Charm and Confide. It's not as efficient, but at least lets me do the thing I know best. Not thinking. From here, I just swap into Farrah Giraffe and set up two Nasty Plots and two Agilities, all while taking a few super effective Bug Buzzes, but surviving long enough to Baton pass them over to Skeledurge and take out Frostmoth, Bear Tick, Satitan, and finally the Ice Terra Altaria, all with one Torch Song apiece to win the fight in short order. It's quite nice not having to get all the way up to plus six, as Torch Song just finishes up the setup while going for the one-hit KOs that I wanted in the first place. Not like I needed them, but what's a little bit of overkill gonna hurt? Well, other than Grusha's Pokemon being melted into a pile of goop, but those are the consequences of my actions. With that done, though, it's off to Ortega with the northern end of the map, with his fairy type standing in my way of success. 
Thankfully, though, his lead Azumarill this time around is more of a boon to my success than instead of being a nuisance, using Arbolova to bait out Bounce and using Protect to block them. Just waiting for him to present an opportunity to fire off three charms, then swap over to Pharah Giraffe to Baton Pass three agilities and three nasty plots over to Arbolova. Taking out Azumarill with Energy Ball, Wigglytuff with the same, Doxbone with the third, and finally the Starmobile Revivroom with the fourth. No surprise there, so it's on to Airy. Hey, guess what? We're doing the same thing again. Did you expect anything different? This video's pretty much gone the same way every time. I will not be stopped until I ravage every single trader in the world with the most overkill of setup sweeps ever. After all, it's still just too fun to keep clicking on these moves that are the most efficient way of taking out these teams. Toxicrow can't really do much against Palmet other than use Poison Jab as I take out its attack stat with Charm. Uh, but wait a second, alright, things are a little different this time. Only a single one of them is able to connect as a critical poison jab brings Palmet down to just 10 HP after poison damage. So I've got to figure out something here. Actually, I don't really have to think at all since if I bring in Fair Giraffe, she's just going to go for a sucker punch until it runs out of power points. So I should be able to use two agilities and three nasty plots while she wastes said power points. The only potential problem here is if Poison Jab poisons on switch in, but thankfully she goes for Brick Break like an idiot, so I'm A-OK, -okay. getting up those two agilities and three nasty plots. But hey, why not get the third agility in? Well, that leads to Fair Giraffe getting poisoned for no reason, so I guess I was pretty lucky to see Brick Break earlier. It doesn't matter at this point though, since I can't baton pass over status effect, bringing in Goldango to take out Toxicroak with Shadow Ball, Lucario with Dazzling Gleam, Annihilate with Shadow Ball, Pacivian with Dazzling Gleam, and the Starmobile Revifroom also with Dazzling Gleam to receive my penultimate badge. Good stuff, now to go pummel a large fish and his dragon tuna friend. Thankfully, Don Dozo is incapacitated with Palmet using the likes of Charm, Protect in between those and Bulk Up, and finally Close Combat to one-shot Phase 1 into Oblivion, doing the same to Phase 2 before the special attacking Tatsugiri comes in as Phase 3. This one kind of comes down to the wire though, as Palmet can't really fight against it as efficiently as I would have liked seeing as it's a special attacker, so Charm really doesn't help here, so I opt to swap out into Gold Dango, taking a Muddy Water for less than half as Arvin's Greedent knocks itself out with Takedown doing around a third to Tatsugiri before Gold Dango fires off a Shadow Ball, not quite bringing Tatsugiri below half, but managing to lower its special defense as Dragon Pulse is used over Muddy Water, giving Gold Dango another turn in the fight after Protect and firing off a second Shadow Ball as he then goes for Icy Wind. Huh, well, I mean, that's another turn after Protect, so I go for a third Shadow Ball, barely missing the range on the KO as Tatsugiri finally goes for Muddy Water to bring Gold Dango down to just 3 HP, so after Protecting, I've got a swap. I opt here for Garchomp as I know it will outspeed, Tatsugiri is not going to use Icy Wind as Goldango's speed is lower than Tatsugiri, and Muddy Water will be easy enough to live. The only problem is if we roll into Dragon Pulse, though I believe Garchomp survives it in the red, so who cares? I just go for it, swapping in Garchomp, and sure enough, he goes for Dragon Pulse, and my prediction is correct, Garchomp is left into the red, and the fight is over by this point as Garchomp outspeeds with Dragon Claw, KOing Tatsugiri, and providing me with my last badge. Now then, just Arvin, Glavelle, Penny, the Elite Four, Champion, Nimona, and AI Turo stand between me and victory over this franchise in its entirety. Ten more fights. I know I can do it. I just have to execute. So of course, first up in that 10 fight gauntlet is Arvin, starting off with Greedon as I go with Palmet, mostly to evade paralysis from Body Slam with an Electric type while nerfing him with Charm. Sure, Earthquake is kind of a threat, but I outspeed and manage to hit my first one with Earthquake doing less than half because of it, allowing me to safely get up two more charms, swap to Farrah Giraffe, and begin setting up my three nasty plots and three agilities, getting paralyzed along the way because of Body Slam, but no matter, as Farrah Giraffe isn't fully paralyzed for any turns at all, allowing me to baton pass over to Gold Dango and KO Greedon with Dazzling Gleam, Scovillain with Shadow Ball, Garganackle with Make It Rain, what a freaking attack name, Toad Scroll with Shadow Ball, Cloyster also with Shadow Ball, and finally Mabostiff with a super effective Dazzling Gleam, finishing him off as quickly as I efficiently could. Next up, Clavel starting off with Oranguru as I lead with Arbolova, and let's be honest, if I narrated this whole thing, this video would be 10 minutes longer. The fight is just a story of outlasting exactly yawn and foul play. After about 10 minutes of in-game time though, I'm more than capable of setting up with Fair Giraffe with 3 Nasty Plots and 3 Agilities as per usual, but on passing over to Goldango once more to KO Oranguru with Dazzling Gleam, Houndoom with the same, Poltegeist with Shadow Ball, Amoongus with the same, 
Abomasnow also with Shadow Ball, and finally Quaquavel, terastalizing into a pure water type but still going down to Dazzling Gleam nonetheless, netting me the second of 10 wins. Third up, Penny and her evolutions leading Umbreon as I go with Grimmsnarl, both for the Dark Resistance and for the Confide special attack nerfing. Doing so, then swapping into Arbolova to also nerf Quick Attack, using Charm twice and triggering Seed Sower for the Grassy Terrain to give Fair Giraffe the best chances of surviving any potential critical hit Dark Pulse. Fortunately for me, that doesn't happen as three agilities and three nasty plots are established, and Baton passed over to Goldango for the third time, using Dazzling Gleam to KO Umbreon, Shadow Ball to KO Flareon, doing the same to Vaporeon, Jolteon, and Leafeon, leaving just Sylveon to be absolutely obliterated by a super effective Make It Rain for the KO and the win, opening up the Elite Four for edged levels and as much advantage as I can physically squeeze out of it. Now for the league, I decide on Dragapult, Grimmsnarl, Farad Giraffe, Goldango, Garchomp, and Arbolova. I think we need one Pokemon each to nerf physical and special attackers, with the typings of Arbolova and Grimmsnarl respectively being about as good as I can ask for against Ground, Steel, Flying, Dragon, and Espathra's Psychic typings, though I do have to make one glaring omission. I really wanted to, but I just could not afford to bring in Revivroom. I think it probably would have been the replacement for Garchomp, but essentially the plan was to use Revivroom and its access to Gastro Acid to neutralize Espathra's opportunist ability so that I could effectively set up Sweep against Gita. But I think I can still pull it off regardless if I only lower its special attack then use like one to two nasty plots so that it doesn't get back up to neutral. One quiz later though, and we're ready. Rika starts off with Whizcash, myself with Grimmsnarl, and as expected, Six Confides destroys the special attack of Whizcash, but it's still a threat as I swap into Dragapult, having to proactively protect to block the first Blizzard before starting my Dragon Dance attempts, taking the second Blizzard for minimal damage, thank goodness for no crit, protecting the third, then dodging the fourth so I can protect the fifth, finishing off my Dragon Dances afterwards and KOing Whizcash with Phantom Force, Doug Trio with Dragon Darts to prevent Sandstorm from being established, Dawn Fan with Dragon Darts to evade Sturdy, then finally Phantom Force on both Camerup and Claude Sire, evading the latter's Protect and obliterating Rika straight away. Now for Poppy, her fight is a little more worrisome considering I want to again use Dragapult to eliminate the risk of Magnazone, both for Sturdy and its ability to use Light Screen for any of my special attacking sweepers, in this case just Goldango. This of course starts with Arbolova using Charm to lower Kaparaja's attack, thankfully being able to use the first against Stealth Rock, but the first manages to trigger Seed Sower so that Arbolova heals more effectively, letting me basically have full HP as I swap out into Dragapult and start playing the odds against Playrough. Thankfully, after six turns of that and alternating with Protect, the odds go in my favor, I set up all six Dragon Dances and take out Kaparaja with Phantom Force, Corviknight with two Dragon Darts following an Iron Defense, Bronzong with Phantom Force, Magnazone with Dragon Darts, and finally the Steel Terra Tinkaton with Phantom Force to win the match. Now Larry, of course, is a lot less sus, actually, because Tropius is not that good of a Pokemon at this stage of the series, and Grimmsnarl is easily able to hold its own against sun-powered solar beams, letting me set up six Confides before swapping out into Fair Giraffe to set up three Nasty Plots and three Agilities, but so on passing them over to Gold Dango to hit Shadow Ball on Tropius, Dazzling Gleam on Altaria, Dazzling Gleam on Staraptor, Shadow Ball on Oricorio, and finally Shadow Ball on Flamigo to win that fight just as well. But we seem to alternate between easy fights and playing the odds fights, as Hassel's lead Noivern is a bastard. It has Super Fang, which is guaranteed to always do half damage, so we have to play around that as best we can with Grimmsnarl, using Confide to lower the potential of Air Slash, Dragon Pulse, and Hyper Voice, though of course the second attack doesn't do anything to Grimmsnarl, but it does do something to Fair Giraffe who ends up being slotted in second to set up the normal three nasty plots, three agilities, managing to survive through the assault and get back to nearly full HP, probably because Noivern ran out of power points for Super Fang by this point, allowing me to once again baton pass over into Goldango, using Dazzling Gleam to take out Noivern and Haxorus, Shadow Ball and Dragalge, then Dazzling Gleam on both Flapple and Baxcalibur to clear out the Elite Four in pretty good time, all things considered, for Paldea. Now for Gita. Oh god, Gita. I did not realize that Fairy did not resist Fairy here and thought Grimmsnarl would take neutral damage from Dazzling Gleam on her lead as Fathra. I forgot, uh, that just in no ifs, ands, or buts about it, I just forgot that Fairy doesn't resist Fairy and realized I was wrong. 
Thankfully, it does take less than half without even a single confide, so by alternating with Protect, I do manage to get up three of them before Grimmsnarl goes down to too little HP to even survive another one, nerfing it enough for me to bring in Fair Giraffe relatively safely. This still results in a barrage of Dazzling Gleams and having to take a critical hit on Switch in, but with Protect, I'm more than capable of setting up three agilities and a single nasty plot to bring Espathra to plus six speed, but still at minus one special attack. Baton passing into Goldengo on the worst possible turn as she starts using Lumina Crash, presumably because Espathra ran out of power points for Dazzling Gleam, lowering Goldengo's special defense by two stages, but managing to allow me to fire off a Shadow Ball following a second Lumina Crash to KO next turn, leading to Avalug, who also goes down to a plus two Shadow Ball following a Protect. Third out is King Gambit, whom I'm really worried about not one-shotting, but following Protect, Dazzling Gleam connects and uh, misses the one-shot, leaving it in the low yellow as Katao Cleave KOs Goldengo. If it weren't for the power of friendship, baby, Goldengo lives on, firing off another Dazzling Gleam next turn to KO and giving me free reign to finish off the rest of Gita's team, tearing through Veluza with Shadow Ball, Gogo with Shadow Ball as well, and finally the Rock Terra Glamora with a super effective Make It Rain, winning the fight but not without once again playing the odds. I really should have just brought Rev of Room in here instead of Garchomp since I did not use it once. But hey, I at least didn't lose one of my best special attackers. However, I'm going to be benching it for the fight against Nimona here, replacing it with Skeledurge since I believe it's too close to the level cap to make it through Area Zero otherwise. Thankfully though, the fight against Nimona is pretty easy, using Arbalova's combo of Seed Sower and Charm to neutralize Lycanroc, then swapping out into Fair Giraffe to use three agilities and three nasty plots, all while realizing that Fair Giraffe's ability in Armor Tail actually makes priority moves do nothing, nullifying Acceleroc, which for some reason she just keeps going for. It's not like every turn, but I did get a fair few turns where she did, blessing me with less of a chance of getting hit with a critical before Baton passing over to Skeledurge following a failed Acceleroc, essentially giving me a free switch instead of outspeeding and risking a crit on Skeledurge, then blasting her team by KOing Lycanroc with Shadow Ball, Orthworm with Flamethrower, Gudra with Shadow Ball, Dedunsparce with Flamethrower, Pommut also with Flamethrower, and finally her Grass Terra Meowskarada in one final super effective Flamethrower to burn her down, finishing the penultimate fight of the run. Now then, one more fight. One more battle stands between me and victory in this series, a 16-month adventure, albeit with a hiatus, since I still do not like Alola and you will never get me to like Alola unless somebody makes like a ROM hack that takes out all cutscenes, and even then I'd probably only like Ultra Sun and Moon because of its added challenge, but I digress. With that said, Area Zero is actually an easier endeavor here due to learning of two skips that I had no idea existed prior to this run, cutting down on travel time through here by about 15 minutes or so before releasing the last batch of future paradoxes, fighting them off, and reaching AI Turo. One bastard father who left his kid to go get milk and cigarettes from the future, but instead got weird Pokemon. He's the final obstacle, so let's break him down. First up, Iron Moth as I go with Grimmsnarl and oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck, I did not realize Sludge Wave was the, the KO straight away. I did not get up a single confide and I'm going to have to wing the rest of this fight since there's no way I can set up anybody safely against a neutral special attack Iron Moth. Instead, I just decided to bring in Garchomp here to outspeed and obliterate it with a quad effective Earthquake leading to Iron Bundle. Of course, due to my quad weakness to ice, I swap out into Pommet to take Freeze Dry, only taking about half damage and letting me protect the heal back up a bit before squashing this bird with a super effective Double Shock. A very powerful move that gets rid of my electric typing, which is not really the best against Iron Jugulus out third, but I should still be able to KO because it's a 120 power super effective electric physical move, is what I would say if it was usable a second time. Turns out it not only strips you of the electric typing which is mentioned in the move's description, it just no longer can be used while out. That was not in the move's description, and I've never used this move in my entire life, so I did not realize this move would fail because of that. Feeding Palmet to Iron Jugulus's Air Slash to KO my second Pokemon, putting us back to parity at 4 versus 4. Thankfully, I can just bring in Goldango to blast this thing with a Dazzling Gleam and... Oh. It gets outsped and dies instantly to Dark Pulse. I forget that Goldango sometimes is, like, actually pretty low in speed stat in comparison to the rest of, like, the really good Pokemon that came out of this generation. And I continually forget that Steel no longer resists Dark past Gen 4 for some reason. I 
I'm not playing well here. However, I can bring in Garchomp as my best option at this point. As this is Dark Flying, not Dark Dragon, and without coverage for dragons, I set up a single sword stance while taking a Dark Pulse for pretty minimal damage, protecting next turn before KOing with a Dragon Claw, then KOing Iron Thorns with a quad effective Earthquake, leading to Iron Hands. It's also Electric type, so it goes down to Earthquake, leaving just Iron Valiant. Currently praying to god that it doesn't outspeed, so I can just blast it with a neutral earthquake before dying to a fairy type move, and after that ability is fired off with quark drive... Yes! We outspeed, nailing earthquake, and one-shotting to KO. Finishing the run, the series, everything... is over. I win, no ifs, no ands, no buts. I have finished this albatross that has been hanging around my neck for 16 months. I do take the celebratory Maridon fight, winning the scripted duel, and riding off into the sunset. Excited to come up with new ideas to bring you all in future videos. But with that, that's the end of the franchise Nuzlocke. An adventure I brought you guys aboard for over a year, and it's finally come to an end. I'm happy that you guys finally have the full series, and no longer have to ask in the comments when the next one will be. I still have a ton of plans for this channel, like I said in the intro, and I hope you come along for the craziness that's up ahead. Also, I want to give another big thank you to Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring the end of the franchise Nuzlocke. Make sure to go give them a check out in the link in the description. It really helps out the channel. Oh, and I suppose I should mention I'm planning on having this entire series re-edited and formatted to put into a single video. Though with my editor's hard drive corrupting about halfway through this series, I'm not sure if we actually have all of the source files. If not, it may be a little more scuffed than I would have liked, but we'll figure it out and you guys will hopefully get oh, I don't know, a nearly 20-hour completely re-edited version of this with intros and outros removed and it flowing as a one continuous narrative. I think it'll be pretty fun to re-experience the whole thing. But with that, I must bid you adieu. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you guys next time.